And uh, if you find page, what are we on? Page 122, is that right? All right, 122. We are talking about the fruits of the Spirit. And, um, and tonight we're going to get to the final fruit, which is temperance. Now, I'm going to take one more week and just kind of review everything, tie it all back together, uh, because I felt like there was just too much to kind of uh, hit the last fruit and then tie it all back together. So uh, you might think, oh, we're done this week. Finally, we get through all the fruits, and I want to spend one more week just, just kind of reminding us about a few things, tying it all back together next week. But let's just say these fruits together um, and from Galatians chapter 5. Uh, here we go. Let's say this together. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Nine fruits of the Spirit. Now remember, uh, these are things that we are not producing in our, on our own, through our own power, our own strength. We're producing them through God's power and God's ability. We can't do these. Uh, we can't do them on our own. And you say, well, I, 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 have, uh, I can be gentle. You might say, well, I can love, I can have joy, I can get be happy. But you can't do it to the extent that you might say that Jesus Christ was able to do. See, the one that exhibited all these fruits of the Spirit and perfectly was Jesus Christ. Um, and in order to have all these fruits of the Spirit, you, would, you might say, have to be just like Jesus Christ. You say, I can't do that, and I can't either. You see, we have to trust God to give us that ability. We're yielding to the Holy Spirit, submitting to Him. Now, where are you going to find? You say, where, uh, you're just looking around. Where do I find the answers? How do I submit to the Spirit? The answers are in the Word of God in the Bible, aren't they? That's where we're going to find the answers to what we need to do. So, uh, in your books here, the, the, the blank you're going to fill in on page, uh, let's see, I'm on uh, bottom of page 121. The fruit of the Spirit is temperance. This is letter I. And uh, the definition of temperance is this, spirit-controlled, in all of life's pleasures. Um, I might put it like this, allowing all your emotions, passions, and desires to be under the Holy Spirit's control. Everything in your life, you say, I'm, I'm putting it under uh, God's Holy Spirit and His control. Now, one of the things that we think about when we think about uh, temperance um, is we think about the idea of, of sometimes you might say some sort of moderation in something. Sometimes people, when they think about this word temperance, they think about the word self-control. Now, in a, maybe a more secular definition, people might d define it that way. When we come to the Bible, I think we need to uh, call it uh, spirit control rather than self-control. Now, I want you to think about, there's an illustration in the Bible. If you want to look at this uh, story with me, um, this illustration by the Apostle Paul, he talks about running a race. And I believe this is a good illustration. It's not in your notes in your book. Uh, but it uses the word temperance, 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. And the Bible tells us about someone uh, that runs in a race. And verse 24 says this, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may attain. Every man that striveth for, master, for the mastery, that's the, the prize, and here's the word, is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run not as uncertainly, so fight I not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it under subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Now, I want to use this illustration and think about this for a minute. Imagine that there's going to be a race. Now, I don't know, does uh, anybody here like, uh, enjoy running as a sport? Did anybody just get up? And, and, uh, and, and I, I tried running in high school. Uh, I, I ran on the track team or the cross country team for one year. Uh, they always had these five Ks. Ever yeah, and you ever see like special days? People get up early in the morning and they run a five K. That's like a little over three miles. And they get out and they run in those races. And I've got a sister that likes to do this. And you know, and uh, you know, on Thanksgiving Day, I'm thinking. You know, I'm looking forward to turkey, and she's getting up early and going on a turkey trot. And I'm thinking, what are you doing? You know, why are you getting up early? It's a day off. I don't want to get up early and, and go out in the cold and run on a day off. I want to stay in where it's warm. But some people enjoy running. Now, imagine me on Thanksgiving Day or some special day, and, and uh, my sister waking me up and saying, hey, do you want to go on a run? And I didn't train. I didn't practice. I didn't do anything. And, and I just get up, and I say, sure, why not? All right, and I just get out there, and I say, I am going to try my absolute hardest. 
and, and I get out there, and I just run full tilt as hard as I can. Oh, and I think, man, I'm not in the same shape I was back in high school. And, uh, and, uh, and, and I run as my best effort. I give it my hardest, you know, and I get to the end. And, and you know, and I'm, and I'm looking, and, and I'm thinking, you know, I didn't win. Why didn't I win the race? I tried my very hardest to win. Well, the truth is, is that although I might have tried my very hardest that day, there was other people that had been preparing for that race long before the race ever happened. Now, when you think about someone, here's the illustration. When somebody prepares for a race, the Bible says in verse 24 that they which run in a race, um, one receives a prize, or I'm sorry, verse 25, and every man that striveth for mastery is temperate in all things. So um, what does that mean when someone running a race is temperate in all things? Well, it means that there's a lot of things that they are either, you might say, not allowing themselves to do, or you might say are compelling themselves to do, to prepare for that race. A lot of times runners, uh, they don't just get up one morning and decide to go for a run. They get up regularly on a regular basis, and they get up at a certain time. And sometimes, even though they go to work at an early time, they get up a couple hours early and go out for a run. And, uh, and they, they, they work hard. Sometimes they have to deny themselves certain things. They say, you know what, I really like, uh, I like drinking Coca-Cola, and, and I love a tall glass of Coca-Cola, but I don't want to drink a whole lot of sugar. I don't want to take a whole lot of sugar in my body. I've got to eat more healthy things. So I'm going to reject certain things in my life. Now, here's the illustration is that a runner would put themselves under some sort of self-discipline, all right? Now, but Paul, in this same passage, notice what he says in verse 27, but I keep my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So uh, Paul is talking here about bringing his body into some sort of subjection, some sort of discipline. Uh, what is he submitting to? Now, as I said, some people want to think about temperance as self-control. Paul is not talking there about bringing his body into his own discipline, his own rules, his own concepts of what he wants to do with his body. He's talking about bringing it under God's control and under what God wants him to do. And that's the subjection that we're talking about. So rather than, you might say, self-control, we think about temperance, think about a spirit-led life, a life where you're directed by the Holy Spirit. Now, here's the thing that we're trying to do. Just like someone trying to win a race, you want to have victory in your life, don't you? I mean, that's the goal. I hope, that's, I hope you don't enjoy the defeated life. I just, uh, it's another boring day, another bad day. Nothing's going to go good. Everything's going to go wrong. I hope you don't just get content with that type of life. Now, if, you've, if you're in that place right now where you just say, you know what? I'm struggling. I, you know, things aren't working out the way I hope. My hopes and ambitions are not happening the way I hope they would be. I'm not seeing victory over sin in my life. Now, you have to believe, first of all, that you can see victory. You have to believe in the Word of God says, you know, that there is a victorious life. There is victory to take place. You have to believe that God said it, and, and I'm going to believe that that's true. But you've got to say, well, how can I do that? How can I have that? You have to submit to, to the Holy Spirit. You have to trust that Jesus Christ can give you that victory. And I believe it is possible. I believe it can take place. So just like someone trying to win a race, they've got to you say they're, 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 they're not just showing up one day and just trying really hard. See, that's the flesh life, isn't it? When we just think, I can just try harder. I'm just going to push myself harder. No, we have to bring ourselves into subjection. Now, here's the thing. Just like me showing up one day at a race and just expecting something to happen on that day, it doesn't happen, does it? Now, if you want to have victory... You might say tomorrow and next week and six weeks from now and a year from now. Guess what? You can't wait till the day you want to have that victory and just think, well, I'll just, I'll just read my Bible one day that morning or I'll get up and have a quick prayer that day. A year from now, that's the day I want to have victory. What are you going to do? No, you have to have, you might say, you've got to prepare for that battle every day. And you've got to, first of all, submit to the Holy Spirit of God every day. You've got to read your Bible every day. You've got to be praying every day. You've got to develop that discipline. You've got to, you might say, be submitting to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will bring you under that discipline. And bring you under this, you might say, regiment where you say, you know what? I'm in the Word of God each day. I'm in prayer each day. I'm in church on Sundays. Are you on Friday nights? 
I'm going to be under that discipline and under those rules. I'm going to subject myself to them. Why? Because I want to win victory. And just like, you know, that rudder that just shows up one day and didn't discipline himself, didn't deny himself, didn't prepare at all, he's not going to win. And you're not going to see victory if you're not practicing these things every day, if you're not submitting to the Holy Spirit every day. Now, uh, here's, here's the next uh, blank that you need to fill in, in, in uh, question, or blank number two. God's plan is for us to face temptation with, conf- with the confidence of knowing that he has provided a way of escape. The way of escape is found in our inner man. Now, this is uh, uh, found in, in the book of uh, uh, 1 Corinthians and uh, I'm sorry, I, it's chapter 10. It's right across the page there. Um, if you're in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, chapter 10, verse 13 says this, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Now, um, when you talk about temptation and facing temptation, some of the things that we want to do sometimes is this. We want to avoid temptation. Now, I will tell you this. Um, when I was in high school as a young man, uh, you can imagine one of the things that uh, young men often struggle with is the idea of sexual desires. Now, uh, what I did is rather than, you might say, try to submit to the Holy Spirit and try to, uh, you might say, see victory in my life, I didn't know how to deal with those desires in my life. And so... I decided to come up with my own kind of coping method of dealing with that. And if there was a girl that you might say started getting too close to me, I would just be mean to that girl. And I would just, you might say, say rude things to her to kind of push her away. And, and sometimes you might say, I really liked a girl, but I would treat her like I hated her. And I thought she was disgusting because you might say that was an easier way to deal with the problem. Now, what happened? Well, <laughs> that started developing a reputation. It didn't work out very good. It wasn't a good plan, you might say, and, and, and uh, people just didn't like me for a while. They thought I was a jerk, you know. I don't know. No. It was pretty obvious I was being mean. I was trying to deal with things in the wrong way. I didn't know how to deal with the temptation. I didn't know how to face that challenge. So I came up with my own method to deal with it, and it wasn't a good method. Now, I will tell you this. You might think, well, that's, that was really stupid of you. Well, guess what? <laughs> I guarantee you've probably done something very similar. You don't know how to deal with your temptations. You don't know how to deal with, you might say, the struggles that you're facing in life. So rather than look at God's answers and how God says to face those temptations, we come up with our own methods of dealing with it. And sometimes we, we, we work out things in our head where we think, oh, this is how I can deal with it. Instead of just giving, going to God and looking to Him for answers. Now, here's the thing. We're, we're talking here... Listen, what does it say in your book here? God's plan is for us to face temptation. It doesn't say run from it, does it? It doesn't say avoid it. We're not talking about, you might say, you know, just trying to hide out and and never face those temptations. Sometimes people try to hide from temptation. And sometimes people, you might say, uh, try to uh, do things to put rules in their life and regulations in their life. Now, sometimes those things are good things. Some of those regulations are good. But I think about some people that go to the extreme. For instance, uh, uh, here in Pennsylvania, we have a lot of Amish people. Now, the Amish people, one of the things they're trying to do is keep people from going into sin. So what do they do? They say, well, you don't even have electricity in your house. Now, I don't know about you, but I kind of enjoy electricity sometimes. It's kind of a fun thing to have. Uh, it's, it's nice to have electricity. I'm not ready to become Amish. So, so their, their thinking is, you know, if you have a television in your home, you're going to be faced with temptation. If you have a computer in your home, you're going to be faced with temptation. So let's just get away with, get rid of electricity. They're trying to avoid temptation. But I guarantee that's not the answer in your life is to just avoid it or just put multiple layers of things that you're not going to do uh, that, that, that don't make sense. Now, obviously, there's certain things uh, that you should avoid. There's certain things you should say no to. There's certain things you know you have a problem with. You shouldn't go near those places. But... Um, the idea here is we want to face temptation. Now, when we talk about facing temptation, we're facing it with God's power and a confidence of knowing that God can help us with that temptation. Now, we're, here's what it says again, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Sometimes our, our, our temptations feel unique. 
the problem we're facing. You think nobody knows what I'm going through. But the Bible says it's, 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 it's not unique. It's common to man, but God is faithful, and he's never going to cause you to be, suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. Uh, 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 above that you are able. He said there's no temptation you're going to face where there's not a way of escape. Nothing you're going to face. Now, sometimes it feels like you have to give in to that temptation, but you don't, and you can have victory. And, uh, and we're going to talk more about how to do that and how to have that victory. So, now... I want you to turn with me uh, to, to Romans chapter number 6. Uh, Romans chapter 6. And um, we're going to look at some verses here in Romans chapter 6. Uh, beginning in verse number 1 and 2. Now, uh, here's, here's the thing. Now, when we say uh, uh, avoiding certain things, like, well, would you avoid electricity to keep you from sin? You have to realize there are some things that God demands as being sinful and we must abstain from these behaviors anything that god says is sin we do not need to be involved in we do not need to go near we do not need to touch god says it's sinful and it's wrong now romans chapter 6 verse 1 and 2 says this what shall we say then shall we continue in sin that grace may abound god forbid how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein uh this is talking to christians this is talking to someone who's received Jesus Christ as their Savior. Now, do Christians still sin? Yes, they do. Let me ask you this. As a Christian, if you go to God and you confess your sin, the Bible says what, according to 1 John 1, 9? If we confess our sins, He is what? Faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Isn't that great to know? That He's going to forgive you. So, if you sin as a Christian, you can know, well, God's going to forgive me. Now, and, and, and when you get forgiven, you think, boy, God's shown me such wonderful grace to forgive me. And you think, I really enjoy that grace. Maybe I'll go back and sin some more. <laughs> that's, not a, that's not a good logic, is it? And the Bible here says, what are we going to do? Are we going to continue a sin that grace may abound? I like being forgiven. I like uh, the, the fact that God keeps forgiving me. So I'll just keep sinning. That's a bad logic and a bad thought. Why? Why? Because the Bible says we're dead to sin. We're, the Bible says that when we got saved, that's, that's God, Jesus Christ went to the cross to defeat sin. Why would you want to go back to something that put Jesus on the cross? Why would you want to do that? And then you've accepted him as your savior and he's defeated sin and he's defeated the power of sin in your life. Why would you want to go back to an enemy that, that Jesus Christ has defeated in your life? Why would you want to do that? So if you're dead to sin, why would we go back to sin? The Bible says, God forbid. Now, Here's uh, uh, later on here in Romans chapter 6. Look at verses uh, 6 and 7. The Bible says this, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, um, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, you've been set free. Now, with your freedom, you might say, Woohoo, I can do whatever I want. And what do people do with their freedom in Christ? Well, some of them go right back to sinning, don't they? They turn right back around and they head right back and you think, you know, um, can you imagine uh, uh, being, you might say, kidnapped and, and, you know, the U.S. military sends the Navy SEALs down from helicopters and they come in and rescue you and pull you out of this uh, kidnapping and, and take you somewhere safe and you say, thank you so much. I'm going to head right back to where I get those kidnappers. What? Why would you do that? <laughs> Why would you go right back to that? And that's what people do. They go right back... Um, to what Jesus saved them from. You've been, you've, you're, you're freed from sin. Now, uh, here's uh, um, in your book here, and it's up on the, uh, it says, God destroyed the power that sin had over us so that we could serve someone other than self. This someone that we would serve through the submission of his leading will bring us freedom. And um, so we have to realize that we need to submit to God and we can have that freedom. But he's destroyed that power of sin. You don't have that power of sin over in you in your life. But we do still have the desire. That's letter C. That's the next one here. Uh, God does not want you to yield to those desire, old desires anymore. The power is gone. But what's it say? But the desire is still there. Isn't that interesting? He's defeated the power of that sin in your life. It, that grip that that sin has in your life. 
but you still have that desire. To destroy the desire, we must yield to God's power in our life. Here's back in Romans chapter 6, verses 12 through 14. The Bible says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members of instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. The Bible says you're free. Uh, and so now with that freedom, what's your decision going to make? What are you going to do with, your, with that freedom? It says you have to yield to something. You have to submit to something. And some people go back to submitting to sin. But the Bible says, what, do you, what should you do? Don't yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness, but, in verse 13, Yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, as a Christian. Uh, act like a Christian, behave like a Christian, submit yourselves to God as instruments of righteousness unto God. You see, uh, we have a choice. See, the unbeliever really doesn't have that choice. They continue to submit to sin. But we as a Christian, we have a choice. I can either submit to God or submit to the sinful way of life. And sadly, people still have that desire, so they keep going back. And even though they've been set free, they go back to that sinful way of life. They keep submitting to it. Now, um, uh, if you look here in, in letter D, then, uh, our book says this. If we indulge in fleshly appetites, they will grow stronger. If we feed the spirit-led appetites, they will grow stronger as well. Be careful. God will never feed a fleshly appetite, but we will after we tire of performing it in our own power. Now, uh, just a minute ago I was talking about, you might say, sometimes we set up fences and we set up rules like the Amish where they don't allow electricity to try to keep them from temptation, to keep them from sin. And so often, you might say, we try to do certain things, you might say, in our own flesh. We make certain decisions. We try to do things uh, to try to live the Christian life without God's power. We try to figure it out on our own. We try to come up with our own method of living the Christian life. And sometimes what we do is this, we perform the Christian life. In fact, we go through a routine, and, and somehow, you might say, we've convinced ourselves, and, 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 and you say, what's the difference? Because I believe a real Christian will develop, you might say, a, a humble attitude submitting to God. But a performing Christian will develop a proud attitude of what they're doing. They're so proud of themselves because they got up and they were reading their Bible that morning. They just think, boy, I'm such a great person. <laughs> and they just start thinking of how great they are of, you know, boy, I read so much of the Bible today. I didn't just read one chapter. I read three chapters today. And they think, and you know what? I prayed for everybody on my prayer list today. And they start getting this prideful attitude. And they are performing the Christian life in pride and through their own efforts. And sometimes we do this. Sometimes we, we, we're so proud of ourselves, we just want to pat ourselves in the back. Boy, I was at church today, and I shook everybody's hand, even people I didn't like. I'm such a great Christian. And they start lifting themselves up with pride and performing the Christian life. And, and, you know, and, and each day they just think of ways they can feel better and better about who they are. And that's what we're talking about here. You might say someone that would perform the Christian life in their own power, and their own strength. But what happens to that Christian? Um, they have not developed, you might say, the ability to depend on the Holy Spirit to help them through the struggles. In fact, I think sometimes Satan allows us to make us think, hey, you're doing a great job as a Christian. He'll just pat you right on the back as well, saying, you're doing good, because he knows that pride goeth before what? Before a fall. And see, sometimes when we're doing this performance Christianity, where we're just lifting ourselves up with pride and doing it in our own efforts, we don't realize that we're just, you might say, doing it through, uh, what his pastor was talking about, what we might call good flesh. And we think that it's good because we, we're, we're doing it through our own efforts and we think we're doing such a good thing. But we haven't learned to trust the Holy Spirit. We haven't learned to submit to him. And we aren't trusting him to overcome temptation. And so temptation will still come. Problems are going to come. And that performing Christian that you might say is patting themselves on the back and doing things out of pride, temptation is going to come, problems are going to come, and guess what's going to happen? They are going to fall. They're going to fall because they didn't yield to the Holy Spirit and allow God to help them to develop, you might say, that, or to, to give them the victory. They're trying to do it in their own power. 
Romans 6, verses 16 and 18. Know you not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. Verse 18, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. You've got to realize there's a difference between performing the Christian life and submitting to the Holy Spirit and allowing God to give you the victory. When you start thinking, I can do it in my own power, you're going to fail, you're going to fall. And make sure we're submitting to the Holy Spirit. Now, here's the thing. Um, there's each of these fruits of the Spirit that we've talked about. There is, you might say, a work of the flesh that we often turn to as well. And while you might say temperance is this idea of a discipline that we would develop by submitting to the Holy Spirit, but we also realize that there's an opposite of that, or a work of the flesh, what we would call self-indulgence. Now, self-indulgence is this. It's uh, self-control, um, which ceases to control itself. Uh, self uh, self-indulgence, self-control when it ceases to control itself. And, and that's really kind of the example I was given to you, patting yourself on the back, performing your Christianity. But oftentimes, you know what I've, I've found that performing Christians often like to do? Is sometimes they like to reward themselves by indulging in sin. They try to reward themselves. Boy, you've been such a great Christian. Why don't you take some me time and do something fun for yourself and indulge yourself in some sort of sinful pleasure? And they, 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 at the end of the week, after they had such a good week of performing their Christian life, then they go back to, you might say, another bad week of indulgence because they were doing it in their own power, their own strength. And they, they give themselves a, a reward, you might say, for their, their performed week of, of good Christianity. They give themselves, you might say, a, a, a secret time of self-indulgence, and then they go right back to that sinful behavior. And that's really what happens, you might say, with this work of the flesh, self-indulgence. Now, um, what, what's the answer here? Here's, there's, there's three blanks here, A, B, and C on, in your book here. And I want you to think about these appetites. To try to explain, you might say, uh, how we would, uh, what we're facing when we're talking about this. We have appetites. Now, here's, here's the, the first one. The first blank is this. Some appetites need to be satisfied. Some desires need to be satisfied. Now, here's, here's a verse, Matthew chapter 5. It says this, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now, I want you to think about this. Do you have sometimes a desire that's a good desire, a good appetite? Now, uh, maybe you have, as a Christian, the desire to help somebody in need. Now, is that a desire you should feel? Absolutely. If you, uh, you, know, if, if you think, you know what, if somebody's hurting, I, should, I want to help them. Well, fill that desire. What about a desire for fellowship with other Christians? You say, boy, I, I like being around other Christians. I like talking with them. I like fellowshipping with them. Is that a good desire? Yes, it is. That's something you should try to satisfy. Uh, what about a desire to witness and tell someone about Christ? You think that's a good desire? Absolutely. Now, sometimes there's attitudes and appetite, or a, there's appetites that we have that we should be satisfying, that we should be fulfilling, but we're actually denying those appetites. We're, de we're not fulfilling those appetites that we should have. That's a problem as well, isn't it? When we have good desires and, and, and good things that God has put in our heart to do, and we're not doing them, is it a good thing to desire to spend time with God in Bible study and prayer? Yes, it really is. And we have those good desires and those good appetites we need to make sure that we are, uh, or we are satisfying them in the right place, in the right way. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And you will fill, you might say, this satisfaction from, from fulfilling and satisfying those appetites. Now, the second thing, though, letter B, is this. There's some appetites that need to be starved. And you would never want to uh, fulfill these appetites, no matter what. You should not try to... Satisfy these desires. Now, if, if you remember Galatians chapter 5, uh, if you want to turn there, I know it's getting late. We've uh, already been here a long time. But just to kind of refresh, refresh your memory, the book of Galatians chapter 5 is where we have our fruits of the Spirit. But right before that, the Bible talks about the works of the flesh. Uh, and and I, I won't go through all of these, but a couple of these, uh, one of the things that the Bible talks about, if you notice, comes up many times here, 
It says in verse 19 of uh, Galatians chapter 5, Now the works of the flesh that are manifest are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred. Uh, here's what I want to focus on. Hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness. But if you notice, actually, the word hatred and wrath and strife, the idea of anger seems to pop up on some of these words. Now, uh, one of the things that we sometimes have a desire is we have a desire, you might say, to get revenge. We have a desire to get back at someone. We have a desire even, you might say, to see someone hurt. We allow these revengeful feelings to uh, build up inside of us. I will tell you this, it's never right to satisfy those desires. That is a desire that has to be starved. You cannot seek to do that. If you are seeking revenge, if you're seeking to hurt somebody, no matter what they've done to you, if you are in, you might say, the desire for revenge, you are satisfying a wrong desire. And so that is an attitude that we would say, it definitely, 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 you've got to realize it, it needs to be starved. Because wrath and anger can lead to murder, just like Cain killing his brother Abel. You've got to starve that appetite, and you hope you recognize that. But all these other works of the flesh... What about the sexual ideas, you know, adultery, sex outside of marriage, fornication and uncleanness and all these other deviations from God's design for sex within the bounds of marriage? When you're following after these desires and you say, I have a desire for some other sexual gratification other than God's design, I would tell you that is an attitude and that's a desire that needs to be starved. Sexual desires. Um, and maybe there's other, you might say, desires that you would have that you understand when it comes to drugs and alcohol. Now, here in the Bible, the Bible talks about, in, in verse 21, drunkenness, revelings, and the such like. Uh, revelings is a party attitude, and drunkenness. And so the idea of going out, and you might say ingesting some sort of uh, beverage that would, would give you a buzz, or, or sniffing and snorting and injecting something into your body that would give you some sort of high, those things, you might say, are things are, are desires and appetites that have to be starved. You cannot satisfy them, and you should not seek to satisfy them. Now, the third thing, though, is this. So we have some appetites we need to seek to fulfill and satisfy, some that we need to starve, and the third is this, some that need to be suppressed. Now, in, in the book of Corinthians, Paul talks about things that you might say are lawful for me. He says, but they're not expedient. In other words, he says, it's not necessarily that these things are wrong. It's not necessarily that, that, um, that I, I can't do these things at all. He said, but it's not good for me to, you might say, uh, do these things. Now, let me give you an example. Sleep. Now, I hope that you sleep at night. <laughs> I hate to see you guys if you don't get some sleep at night. We'd be really grumpy around here, wouldn't we? We'd really be angry with each other. Now, is it a good idea to get a good night's rest? Absolutely. Is it good to take days off and rest, you might say, periodically for holidays or, or rest times? In fact, in the Old Testament, the, the Israelite people, God told them to take a Sabbath of rest and told them to take special days of rest. Absolutely, it's a good idea to rest. But is it a good idea to, you might say, uh, indulge in rest and sleep to the point of laziness and sloth? Can we overindulge and, you might say, sleep and rest and, and get so focused on our rest that we don't want to do anything and it leads to laziness, absolutely. <laughs> and there's some days that, you know, I even get to that point, you know, on a special day that I want to sit down on the couch maybe after Thanksgiving and after I ate a big meal and I just want to rest and someone says somebody's got to do the dishes and I'm sitting there with my stomach all filled and I don't want to get up and do the dishes. Yes, I get lazy sometimes. Yes, that attitude comes. And, and, but what do we have to do when those attitudes come? When those appetites come, we have to suppress them and realize, you know what? This is not expedient for me. This is not good for me to entertain. I've, I've had enough rest. I'm not needing rest because my body is physically exhausted. I'm just resting because I want to, because I enjoy it. And so that needs to be suppressed. Now, I just talked about Thanksgiving. Now, Easter's coming up. And you think, oh, boy, you're going to talk about food when there's a holiday coming up. Because, uh, you know, I know uh, sometimes... Uh, holidays, like we're going to have a breakfast here and then we're going to go to dinner in, in the afternoon. And so sometimes, uh, you know, you're, you're trying to force down because everybody made a dish. Oh, you made something. Oh, yeah, I got to get some of that. Oh, wow, you made something. That really looks, I guess I'll have a piece of that. And you're so stuffed. And then someone says, time for dessert. And you think, all right, yeah. And, um, 
and uh, you know you're 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 eating way too much food, and then someone the kids say, "I got my Easter basket. Look at all the candy." And Dad says, "Yeah, let me take my portion, my tithe here from the Easter basket, and <laughs> and then I have to eat that. It's a tough day, right?" Now, is there a point where food is good? Absolutely. Do you need to eat food to survive? Absolutely. But can you get to the point where you're stuffing down too much food and involved in gluttony? Yes. So do you understand there's things like that where we would suppress those feelings? It, do we need money? Absolutely. You, you, you realize uh, to survive and to live in this world, you have to have money. You can't just take all your money and burn it and flush it down the toilet and say, uh, I don't need that. You do. <laughs> But is there a point that you can follow after money and desire money to the point that you get greedy and have such a lustful desire for money that it's unhealthy? Absolutely. You see where you have to realize God's limit on these things and have to realize where it goes from being a necessity to becoming a lustful desire. And you have to suppress those feelings. Now, I won't take the time. There's a couple verses in Ecclesiastes and Ephesians there at the bottom that you need to look at and think about. But... Uh, I will leave you with uh, this idea of we're talking about temperance. Temperance is the idea of we're bringing our body into subjection. Remember Paul said that when he talked about running that race? He says, I am going to bring my body under subjection. I am going to put myself under God's authority, under the Holy Spirit of God's authority, and I'm going to trust him. Now, to do that, you've got to believe that God has the best plan for your life, and that when you submit to him, it's going to bring the good result. And I believe it will. But as long as you have it in your mind that if I do it my way and according to my thinking and according to the way I want, it's going to bring a good result, you're never going to submit to the Holy Spirit. And I'm telling you, this is the best thing that can happen to you. This is the greatest thing you can learn is to submit to God's Holy Spirit. Next week, we'll, we'll kind of wrap this study up and kind of review some of our fruits as we talk about it. Let's have a word of prayer and then we'll, we can talk here in just a minute, all right? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word of God tonight. Help us, Lord, to submit to your Holy Spirit and help us to have the fruit of the Spirit, temperance, in our lives. In Jesus' name.